Hello, it's Bruce Williams again, and I would like to give you a brief lecture on various diseases that affect the liver and the gallbladder in swine. As I do before all of these lectures, I need to thank the folks who have provided these images to me over the years. Here's a very common incidental finding that is seen in swine, usually those raised outdoors, and these are known as milk spots. Milk spots are the end result of migration of two common helminth parasites of pigs, Ascaris suum and Stephanurus dentatus, who pass through the liver on their migration to their final resting place as adults. These areas are primarily composed of fibrous connective tissue, which give them a white, often depressed appearance, but also will have areas of granulomatous and eosinophilic inflammation. This is a liver from a piglet, probably less than two years of age. And there are small white dots which represent areas of necrosis scattered throughout all of the lobes. And this is what you see with pseudorabies infection. We've already talked about pseudorabies in pigs, and that is a severe disease primarily in piglets. And you will see areas of necrosis characteristic of alpha herpes virus infections in multiple organs including the liver is seen here, as well as the brain, the spleen, which is in the middle with several large areas of black discoloration, which is just pseudomelanosis and not part of the lesion. And you may see them in other organs as well, such as the lung and adrenal glands. In older pigs, pseudorabies may be totally asymptomatic or may result in areas of necrosis within the lung, but rarely causes clinical disease. And it may also be a cause of abortion, stillbirth, or weak piglets in infected sows. Compare those areas of necrosis, which are generally the same size in pseudorabies, with these areas of inflammation necrosis seen in the liver of a grower finisher pig, which are variably sized, often coalescing, and should make us think of bacterial infections. Bacterial infections tend to happen over a period of a couple of days, so the older lesions will be larger, and over time the inflammation that they cause and the neutrophilic inflammation will bridge areas of normal tissue between these necrotic areas and give us this pattern. And this is a great pattern for any type of gram-negative sepsis. But when I'm thinking about pigs, one of the first things that I'm going to think about is going to be the host-adapted salmonella, both salmonella enterica, salmonella cholerasuis, and salmonella typhusus, which we talked about in the GI tract. Remember that the host-adapted salmonella generally causes septicemia rather than an enteritis, and the non-host-adapted forms will cause an enteritis, like salmonella typhimurium. This is not to say you can't see enteritis with cholera suis and typhi suis, but is generally later on in the disease process and the more subacute to chronic cases. Another lesion that you will classically see when salmonella in multiple species is a fibrinonecrotic, fibrinous, or maybe fibrinosuppurative cholecystitis. Salmonella love to go to the gallbladder in many species, and the gallbladder is always one place that you should not only examine, but culture when salmonella is on your rule out list. Another septicemic disease that you should consider, along with salmonella, erysipelas, and streptococcus, which we've all talked about, is actinobacillus suis. We've also talked about that in terms of the respiratory system, but in this wonderful picture by Dr. Mario Quiroga, you can see that there are multifocal areas of necrosis and inflammation scattered throughout the liver. Actinobacillus suis is a very close relative to Actinobacillus pleuropneumoniae, but it chooses to cause damage throughout the system 
instead of focusing on the lung as actinobacillus pleuronomoniae does. It has all the same toxins that make actinobacillus pleuronomoniae such a difficult disease once established to control. You can see lesions in pigs of all age, but generally they're most severe in piglets with mortality up to about 50% in affected litters. Older growing pigs and adults may have similar signs of septicemia, but may also have signs of acute respiratory distress. You can see this condition in pigs of all age groups. And another classic lesion is particular echomotic hemorrhages in many organs. As I always say, when you see hemorrhage, think necrosis. One other comment about the normal liver in pigs is that if you look closely, you will see this prominent network of fibrous connective tissue which separates the lobules. And this is normal for a pig and becomes even more apparent if you look at the normal swine liver histologically. Here's a fairly uncommon infection and one that acts very similar in swine that it does in other species. And the whitish areas of necrosis and inflammation that you see in this liver is a result of infection by the gram-positive organism Listeria monocytogenes. It is un an uncommon disease in swine, which causes much of the same lesions that we expect in other species, including occasionally septicemia and abortion. Septicemia is most commonly in young piglets and will result in death in three to four days. And rarely you may see encephalitis or abortions in infected sows. Don't sleep on listeria because we are currently out undergoing the largest listeria outbreak ever in South Africa, which has already killed over 180 people and has been linked to the consumption of infected sausage. This bacteria in the pig may cause absolutely no clinical signs, but it may colonize the tonsils and be passed out ultimately in the feces, resulting in infection of other pigs in the herd. Here is a very large neoplasm in the liver of a pig. And hepatic tumors are very fairly uncommon in domestic pigs. They are seen with a lot of regularity in Vietnamese potbelly pigs. And you can see both hepatomas and hepatocellular carcinomas. And a very interesting fact that I learned just this weekend from Dr. John Cullen in his lecture on neoplasia of the liver, which is available through the C.L. Davis Facebook page, is that he calls the vast majority of these tumors that do not have metastasis to other organs hepatomas. It is very uncommonly that hepatocellular carcinomas will kill animals due to metastasis, but both hepatomas and hepatocellular carcinomas have a predilection to get very large and to rupture, resulting in fatal hemoperitoneum. I used to look at size as a criteria. I used to look at the number of hepatocytes within trabeculae as a criteria or even some pleomorphism. But having talked to him and viewed his lecture a number of times, I think that he is correct and that the vast majority of hepatocellular carcinomas are actually just hepatomas. And I think I'm going to fall back on distant organ metastasis, either to local lymph nodes or other organs, as a primary feature of malignancy in my future diagnoses. This is a very important disease of pigs, and what I want you to see in this particular image is not just the multifocal areas of hemorrhage and necrosis, but also the fact that this liver is flat. 
It doesn't have the norm or turgor of the liver. It's collapsed in and on itself because the vast majority of the hepatocytes within this liver have died, and we have what's known as stromal collapse. And this is a condition that has traditionally been known as hepatosis dietetica, which results in a concomitant deficiency in sulfur-containing containing amino acids, tocopherols, or vitamin E, and decreased amounts of selenium. It's always very tricky, and I usually use the term vitamin E selenium imbalance if asked for a cause on this particular condition. This is a disease of young, rapidly growing pigs. And what happens is that vitamin E and selenium are very important antioxidants and part of the glut glutathione peroxidase system. And realize that most of the toxins in the body come through the liver where they're often detoxified. But without these important components, they will attack the hepatocytes, resulting in damage to the membranes and massive necrosis. This may be part of a spectrum of disease, which will include vascular lesions throughout the body, also known as exudative diesthesis, which may be seen in the heart as causing ischemia and massive necrosis. People call that disease mulberry heart disease, but as we saw in a previous lecture, there's really no direct effect on the heart. It is simply damage to the vessels that supply it. Here's another image, an older image of hepatosis dietetica. And on cut section, you can easily see this fibrous connective tissue, which is normal in the pig, and it actually it looks very thick in many areas. And that's not because there's more fibrosis. It's because we have necrosis and loss of hepatocytes. You can see in these lobules that their center area is very pale. And the only viable tissue left in some of these lobules is the somewhat tan hepatocytes around the edge. Hepatosis dietetica exhibits a pattern of necrosis that we call massive necrosis. Not massive because it affects the entire liver, but massive because it affects hepatocytes in every part of the lobule from central lobular to mid-zonal to periporal. The difference in color is probably because the periportal hepatocytes in many of these lobules are still somewhat viable. It is not a nice, rich, reddish-brown color because of the fat that accumulates in sick hepatocytes. Sick hepatocytes often have lipid, lipid that accumulates within their cytoplasm because it doesn't take any energy for the hepatocyte to absorb the lipid, but it takes energy to complex it with protein and re-excrete it. So a damaged or energy depleted hepatocyte before it dies generally will accumulate lipid. Here's another disease in which there is tremendous amounts of hepatic necrosis. Notice how flat this liver is and also a diffuse pale color because of the amount of lipid that is built up in the liver that's sick and cannot excrete it. And this is aflatoxicosis. Aflatoxins are produced by a number of fungi, including Aspergillus flavus, Aspergillus parasiticus, or Penicillium puberulum. I always have trouble with that word. They produce a number of major toxins, of which B1, aflatoxin B1, is of the greatest significance. And this is a potent hepatotoxin, not only killing hepatocytes, but often in chronic disease, having the ability to cause carcinogenesis and immunosuppression of the host. This, these fungi will grow on a number of feeds, including corn, wheat, peanuts, and a number of other cereal grains. In pigs, there's a marked age-related difference in the susceptibility to aflatoxicosis with young animals or weaned growing pigs much more susceptible to adults. If aflatoxin contaminated feed is given to a sow, she will pass 
the metabolites in the milk to the suckling piglets. As we said before, in addition to the necrosis that is seen in the acute phase, in a subacute to chronic, you see a lot of sick hepatocytes which accumulate fat to the point where if you cut sections of the liver, they'll actually float in water where they would normally sink in the normal animal. This is a very interesting pattern and I've spent years puzzling over what it might represent when I see it in pigs, cattle, cats, and I think what we have in this particular pig, which is also undergoing massive necrosis, is what we have refer referred to previously. The reddish areas are the central lobular to mid-zonal areas of the liver. When we see hemorrhage, we always think about necrosis because hemorrhage is much darker than necrosis and the two almost always go hand in hand. So I would surmise that the red areas of this lobule are necrotic and the yellow areas are going that way but they're still at the very degenerative lipid accumulating phase. If you told me that this was hepatosis dietetica I would have no problem and maybe even aflatoxicosis in the acute phase. But let's remember that there are a number of other toxins that can cause massive necrosis in pigs. Ones that I would think about would be iron dextran. Because pigs are injected at the first day with iron, because they're born anemic, if you overdose that iron, you will get massive hepatic necrosis. Gossipol has already been mentioned as a hepatotoxin. Cockleburrs, which are weeds that grow in ditches or low marshy areas in a large area of the country. And also cresol or creosote, which we see in anything based with coal tar, including roofing materials, and clay pigeons. I had a question not that long ago about why the central lobular areas are primarily hit in most toxins and what toxins hit the periportal hepatocytes which always seem to survive. And the concept is very important because the central lobular and to a lesser extent the mid-zonal hepatocytes are the ones that do most of the detoxification. What they actually do is when the chemical compounds come into the body, the cytochrome P450 oxidases, which live in the smooth endoplasmic reticulum, will detoxify, or in the case of a number of compounds, will take a, a harmless agent and turn it into a toxic one. And those are the ones that generally cause death of those hardworking central lobular hepatocytes. The periportal hepatocytes have the fewest cytochrome oxidases, and they don't generally get involved in the detoxification process. However, the blood supply to the lobule comes in from the portal areas. If you ever see portal necrosis, selective necrosis of portal hepatocytes, you know that that is a native, very powerful toxin just taking out the first cells it comes to. Luckily for us, there are very few toxins of that nature, the ones that cause periportal necrosis. Let's look at a couple of diseases of the gallbladder. We've already looked at salmonella. This is a, a picture from Plum Island taken by Dr. Douglas Gregg, and we see massive gallbladder edema. And this is a condition that we don't see too often but you can see it with endotheliotropic viruses like hog cholera or porcine pestivirus, or its almost twin porcine asphar virus, which causes African swine fever. I try not to tell the difference of those two. Of course, this could also be a pig in heart failure, but we don't see pigs that get to that age very often. Occasionally, you will see 
colorless in pigs. These may be due to obstruction of the bile duct and, and backup and inspissation of bile, or an underlying, the result of an underlying uh, infection of the gallbladder. Finally, our last picture is the presence of a large roundworm within the gallbladder, and this is Ascaris suum, and it is not uncommon for Ascarids to migrate up the bile duct from the gut and end up in the gallbladder. Well, I hope that you have enjoyed this lecture, and I look forward to doing more lectures for you. Everyone have a great day.